This is the Be The Solution podcast, and I'm your host, Maria Quattrone. Today, I welcome Frank McGovern, father of four, started in real estate in 2010. Mainly, he was wholesaling houses in Philly until about 24 months ago when he transitioned to wholesaling industrial assets nationally. He's passionate about fitness and personal development and helping others. So let's go ahead and welcome Frank McGovern to the Be The Solution podcast. Hi, Frank. How are you? Good, good. I'm doing good. I greatly appreciate you having me on, Maria. Oh, I'm excited to talk with you today. I've known you from a distance for over a decade at this point. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen you do a lot of work, like on one, on yourself, two, in your fitness and health journey, and three, and transitioning in real estate from wholesaling houses in Philly to now you're doing industrial assets nationwide. So I love to dig in all that with you. So we can give a lot of value today to our listeners. Well, let's get right into it, Frank. What made you change from doing the local into the national and how did it come about? And I'm going to guess for you saying anything that it's it came from the personal development work that you were doing. It was part of it. So I had built like a pretty successful and sizable residential ho- wholesale operation in the Philadelphia market. I did like over 600 transactions. And, you know, when I first got in real estate in 2010, I literally just wanted to make 60 grand a year, work for myself and not have to go into an office, you know, and, you know, I accomplished that like relatively quickly. And then, you know, I'm just usually the type of person that's like kind of all in or all out. So like, it was just kind of like, I wanted more, 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 you know, and, you know, from 2010 to 2020, I was like pretty much increasing revenue 20 to 50 plus percent and just kind of had, you know, just large, what I call vanity metrics in mind, lots of transactions, lots of revenue. And that wasn't necessarily equaling more profitability as I was growing and scaling a team. And, you know, it kind of like hit me in like 2019, 2020, where it was like, you know, had an office, a sizable team, local employees that were, you know, W2 employees. And it was just like, I don't want to be doing this stuff. In my mind, you know, I started wholesaling because I didn't have money or, you know, experience connections or anything. And I always wanted to transition to being this like big, you know, developer, you know, well, I got real successful with the wholesaling. And then 2017, 18, 19, I transitioned into fixing and flipping, buying and hold, you build a few houses and just going through all of that. I realized, you know, I don't like managing anything. I don't like managing people, construction processes. You know, and I also realized like I didn't, I didn't even have a real estate company. I, I had a sales and marketing company and real estate was my product. You know, the majority of my career and like the large per- percentage of the transactions. Well, when I was actually doing real estate, fixing and flipping, developing, you know, managing rental properties, I realized I hated that stuff. I like sales and marketing, you know, analyzing deals, finding hidden value within like an asset. So, you know. I had high overhead, you know, because of the team and the transactions I was doing. So I kind of just shut everything down throughout 2020 and 2021 and closed my office, laid off employees and just started leaning on virtual assistants. And it was more like, what am I going to do? I know I don't want to do this. So what am I going to do? So I knew some people you know, that were having success you know, acquiring apartment buildings. So I'm like, well, let me just try to start doing some marketing for you know, apartment buildings and see if I can, you know, just in the short term, do that until I figure something else out. Well, you know, I've done over well over 600 transactions in the Philadelphia market, you know, mainly assignments, never made a six figure spread on a deal. You know, I've made 90 some thousand, 40, 50, 60, 70, you know, but never a hundred, you know, and I was pretty much averaging 10 to 20,000 or so. Well, the first small apartment deal I closed in Ohio was 20 some units, pretty much the same process that I did with houses, you make a hundred and twenty thousand dollar spread, so like that was like ah like you know you're, you're on to something here. You know, that was like pretty much the same work that I've been doing, but significantly more profit just because of the asset that I was going after. I didn't really dive all in at that point. You know, still dabbling like with the residential because it was just more like comfort there. Although I still had in mind I'm like this is it like the bigger deals is like really kind of just fits what I'm looking to do more because I don't need a big team or large overhead to do. You make a lot of money because you don't need to do a lot of transactions. So I start looking into you know, all asset classes, larger asset classes. And the more I looked into like self-storage and industrial in particular, 
and just loved everything about it. Fast forward, maybe like six months after I closed that, you know, the apartment deal, you know, I, I wholesale a $20 million storage facility in Texas that I never went to and was, again, pretty much the same processes that I was doing with houses. This time I make $300,000 on the deal. So once that happened, I was like, fuck the houses. Like I need to, I need to really focus on like these larger assets and kind of go all in on that. And it's certainly been a learning curve for sure, but you know, it's definitely a niche that I found that is going to be what I'll do for the rest of my life. And it's not just wholesaling, you know, I do acquire them, I get equity in them. I'm going to start like raising capital, but it just fits the kind of like lifestyle that I want to kind of be like living a lot more. Cause I, again, I don't need a large team. I don't need to do a lot of transactions and I can make really good money. And that has allowed me to kind of discover and find more stuff that I'm much more passionate and fulfill, fulfilled with, which is like personal development, you know, my fitness and nutrition, like at 40 years old, I'm in like the best shape of my life. And it's not like I got back in shape. Like it wasn't like I was in shape when I was younger, you know, like I'm in better shape at 40 years old than I was in my early twenties. How did that like happen? What transpired that made you want to get into the best shape of your life? Like I would, I would say my change came how most men's pain, change comes, which is through pain. So I'm actually, you know, going through a divorce, which is like almost finalized. But at the end of June, like my wife said, she wanted a divorce. And, you know, for like a week, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself. Like, oh, like, why is this happening to me? Blah, blah, blah. I go to a real estate event in Cleveland, you know, through, that my mentor, Mark Evans, was having. And there was a guy speaking by the name of Wes Watson, who is now like another coach mentor of mine. But he just like really resonated with me. Like it made me really reflect on saying, you know, hey, you've done pretty good in your life, especially compared to where you come came from and like where you kind of set out to go. But if I'm being honest, I don't like scratch the surface, like in terms of what I felt I was capable of because of like half assing stuff, you know, not fully committing, you know, just just not really dealing with issues that I had from like growing up and shit. You know, so again, I was never in shape. I, I'm I'm more of a visionary like salesperson. So like, I don't like tracking numbers and shit like that. And I figured, you know, like the guy, Wes, you know, great follow Wes Watson. If, you know, guys don't follow him, check him out. But he's in like incredible shape, you know. So he's like, you know, you can literally get anything that you want in your life. If you're consistent, disciplined, and you follow your conscience. And I realized I, I usually wasn't following my conscience, but I always know what to do. But too often I would get the fuck it's in a negative way and like not do what I was supposed to do. And I was like not consistent and disciplined. So I'm like, if I can be consistent and disciplined, you know, going to the gym, tracking my food, eating better, you know, stuff that I, I don't like doing and I've never done before in my life, it will be easy to kind of be more consistent and disciplined in other areas, in all areas of my life. Ones that I actually like in particular said to myself, like, I'm going to get a six pack in the next six months, which at the time, again, like was kind of foreign and crazy. I've never had a six pack before in my life other, other than beer. But sure enough, like I, I committed and dedicated and been super disciplined and consistent. And, you know, I got the six pack. And, you know, I realized that like one other time in my life, like I, I did something called 75 hard, which is kind of like a fitness journey. And you Andy know, I, Frisella. Yep, yep. So I did that in 2020 solely because of my drinking. And I wouldn't even tell people I did it because of the drinking. But I was like, oh, if I can stop drinking for a few months, I'll be good. And I won't go back to like getting blackout drunk when I drink. Well, I actually went from 260 to 190 in five months from doing like that program. And then I was I did 75 hard phase one and then I started phase two. And then I tore my MCL like the second day of phase, phase two. So had to get surgery. I was on crutches and that kind of fucked my mindset up. So got back to the drinking. But those two scenarios, like when I dropped the vice, the alcohol, I was consistent in the gym and I was consistent with my diet. You know, at 40 and like 37, I felt better than I've ever felt before in my life. So there's too coincidental to be a coincidence, you know, and, and to me, I'm not unique, you know, like in terms of that, like I know a lot of entrepreneurs like will struggle with alcohol and don't really, you know, aren't really 100% about it. And I can't tell you how many people now that I'm ex extremely, you know, vulnerable and share people will hit me up like that you would not believe and tell me about like issues and, and struggles that they have, you know, and to me, it's just like, I, I just want to share this stuff because too often people, you know, struggle in silence. 
and it just doesn't need to be the case you know and it's like to me if you you surprised how much you know not just your body changes but your mind you know your soul when you just kind of follow your conscience and you're like get really dialed in you know with your discipline and consistency and you do that with your working out and eating to me it's like fucking life changing wow that's a lot and <laughs> that's a lot so how did you decide that you wanted to work you did that apartment deal right? yep. and how did you decide that you had this passion for industrial self-storage like well, it wasn't what, necessarily, did, I wouldn't even say it was like a passion per se, but it just realized. So like the more I looked into, like I started looking into self-storage, you know, then that kind of involved into like industrial as a whole. But if you look at self-storage over the last 50 years, it's been one of the safest assets, not the safest real estate assets, but one of the safest assets over the last 50 years. Whenever the economy has crashed and, you know, all real estate goes down fucking 20 to 50%, look at how much storage has went down, you know, percentage points, minimal percentage points. You don't have to deal with traditional landlord tenant laws. There's no toilets that you have. You're, you're not getting a call about a, a toilet being broken, you know, up until like they're like 30, 40,000 square feet. You don't even need on-site management. They can be managed from afar. The returns that you could get in this space, in my opinion, were, you know, significantly greater than what you could get in the apartment space. So just all of those things combined, it was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, to me, the niches get you the riches, right? Focus on like one thing. So I just said, hey, I'm going to focus more on like the industrial than, you know, all commercial as a whole. And to me, just in, in terms of where we're headed as like a country, like it just leads to more and more demand for storage, like and industrial as a whole, you know. What do you mean by that? So like, tr you know, historically, right? Like people would rather have a big house and experience less, right? Well, that's completely opposite now. People would rather live in an apartment or a tiny home and travel and stuff. Well, if you're living in a more, but we're still big consumers. So if you're living in an apartment or a tiny place, you're going to generally have extra stuff to store in terms of people's purchasing, right? Right now you got people that are like 70, 80, 90 years old. Like they don't really buy online. You know, they are going to be dying off over the next 10 to 20 years. We are going to get to a point where 100% of our population orders almost everything online. Well, that leads to more demand for warehousing, you know, truck parking, which is industrial. Just those two major things, what to me, will have an increase in, you know, industrial, mainly for those two reasons. That makes a lot of sense. People definitely... Housing affordability is going to get harder and harder. Right. So it's like people are going to be forced to live in apartments or like smaller places and need to store their stuff. Yeah. I was just thinking about that. I actually, um, it is going to be harder and harder for first time buyers to get homes. Yeah. yeah. And people think, and this is like on the residential side, like, you know, and we'll see if this is accurate, but people want think housing prices are going to go down. That's not going to happen because we now have a buyer in the market that we never ever had before which is an inst institutional buyers buying up single family properties, right? So even when the consumer side, you know, people aren't buying as less, you know, they're buying up everything that they can because they know that there's, you know, there's only so many houses. So like they're constantly going to be in buying mode moving forward. And we've never experienced that as, you know, as a market. So that will be, you know, to me, um, affordability is going to get harder and harder in my opinion. That then you have all the problems that are going on with all of the lawsuits and real estate sales, uh, commissions, and craziness. A lot of crazy, which really is a big problem for the first time home buyer and pretty much any most buyers generally. You know, they're kind of kind of get all their money together to buy their first property and putting pennies together to get to the table. Yeah. And they are going to be hurt the worst just about like the laws and stuff, like how they're trying to make it like where they reduce the, I'm not, I don't really deal with like, you know, the retail side as much, but I know that there's like lawsuits. They're trying to take away commission or whatever. And more so like that the listing agent gets it. Well, shit, like I've dealt with agents and it's like, if they're not getting their full commission, like then it's like, Oh, well, Hey, like I'm going to like not even show this house. So it's like, in my opinion, like that mindset will trickle down where it's like, well, Hey, like if I'm not even, going to make that much money representing a buyer like what's the point and they're kind of going to almost be left to go about it on their own yeah there definitely will be a 
quite a big fallout from this. Yeah, no, I agree. I think you'll, I think you'll see a very large percentage of individuals leave the real estate sales space. No, I 100% agree. So it's very interesting times for sure. I want to learn more about, Frank, um, you said you, one of the things you had said is like why this is happening to you, right? And then first thing I could think of what you're getting, your wife saying she went divorced. First thing I could think of was why is this happening? This is happening for me. That no, was the precipice, right? Like of. No, 100%. Your, I would, and I, I think was, you were getting to that, but we like scoop past it, and I kind of want to go back. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. It. It's like I was like I did. Yeah, good, good that you brought that up because I only felt that way for a few days or a week, like where I felt bad for myself, right? Like, why is this happening, you know, to me? But then I realized like nothing happens to us; it happens for us. So it's like if you can actually like look at it from that perspective and find the silver lining, you know, you have a huge opportunity to grow and change your life. Or, you know, you can kind of be unaccountable and fold and just like continue to do what you're doing. But it just made me reflect and be like very honest with myself, like because of just, you know, I kind of had a fucked up like life growing up as a kid and like even as like a young adult and stuff. So I have a lot of like trust and abandonment issues that led me to literally not even like trust my wife like that, like to the like from the day that I loved her, like it was like, oh, oh I can't trust her because she has the ability to hurt me in ways that like no one else on the planet does you know, and it made me like reflect that like, hey, like, you know, I'm in this situation because of, you know, me not dealing with issues, me not listening to my conscience, like me not like dropping the voice that I know I should have just me consistently not doing the shit, you know, that I knew I was supposed to do or, you know, j just not following the conscience. And to me, once I started like really just like listening to my conscience, like regardless of how I was feeling, you know, like life change drastically and too often that's kind of and i want to add to too often like you know we don't feel like doing something like we don't do it you know like people will say to me now like it must be you feel like going to the gym it must be nice that you're motivated to go to the gym i don't fucking feel like going to the gym most days i go six days a week and i like play ball on on sundays and i like do other stuff i'm not motivated to go to the gym i committed to go to the gym so I don't give a shit how I'm feeling in the morning, like whatever, like I'm sticking to my commitment, like irregardless. And too often, you know, I didn't do that. You know, like I would, you know, I, I knew for years like that I like shouldn't be drinking, you know, and in my mind, the ultimate control was, you know, drink, control it where like you don't get blackout drunk when you drink. And I tried that shit for a really long time, although my conscience was like, no, like that's never going to work. And then once I actually realized, no, the, the me, the control is like zero. And, you know, it's been, I don't know, I guess like 15 months, like last, not December, that just passed the December before that. But it was one of the best decisions that I ever made in my life. And mine was drinking, right? Like other people, you know, your conscience tells you leave a relationship or pursue a relationship to leave a job or pursue a job or to start a bit like whatever like our conscience always knows what to do now whether you decide to listen to it today tomorrow next week next month next year or never which some people do like that just you know once you start listening to your conscience your life changes significantly yeah it's so difficult for yeah, it, it so is many. it's not like it's you know easy it's simple right like you know when you hear that voice listen but it ain't easy. Like it's a struggle because like we have a dark and a light in us all, you know, we have a bitch voice and a beast voice, right? Like our bitch voice is uh, scared, scarcity, not thinking of abundance, you know, doesn't, you know, thinks that we're not good enough. The beast voice tells you like, fuck your feelings, do what you're supposed to do. And as long as you do that, everything is going to be good. And sometimes it ain't going to be good that day or that, you know, maybe next week, but in the end, listen to your conscience, do the work, you know, you, you will attract everything and anything you will ever want and need in life, in my opinion. That's so true. The simple solves the complex. So yeah, I mean, commitment to do so many, like for example, for work, on a work sale, so many conversations, so many appointments. I've worked down to like this little daily tracker thing. And you now I talked to the team about this, right? I said, so the difference between a goal and a commitment the commitment is, it's like, would you ever leave your house without brushing your teeth? 
You're committed to brush your teeth every day. Yeah. I'm committed to make my bed every day. I'm committed to shower. Like I brought it down to like basic, basic yeah. shit, shit, right? I said, if you make your commitment to make 60 dials and I wrote 20 convos, five appointments, that means you don't finish the day until it's done. Yeah. Well, right? So what right? I like to say is, right, like there's a too often we quote unquote try, right? There's no, you can't. Yeah. There's, you can't when, try. You just exactly. do. When, whenever I say I'm going to try, like I realize in hindsight, like if I ever told somebody I was going to try, the likelihood of that actually happening was slim to none. But if I actually say like, oh, I'm going to do it. Like, that's just a commitment in my mind where it's already going to happen. And I, to use an example, like, you know, when I got started in real estate, I didn't have, you know, money, connections, anything like, and I don't know why I felt this way, but there was no doubt in my mind like that I was going to succeed. Like I committed to succeeding. Like there was no plan B, like there was, like, I'm not saying I didn't question it at times because it wasn't like, you know, simple and easy, but like I was 100% committed. And anything that I've ever done that to, like, I've never gotten what I like, you know, didn't want. Like, I've, I've always gotten what I wanted when I make a commitment. And, you know, kind of back to the marriage, like where I didn't commit to the marriage in the sense, like, it was always like, uh, like, it's probably not going to work out. And just kind of like thinking negatively, you know, focusing more on, you know, the past, the future and not being present and thinking like negatively, like where with the with business, like it was just like, I wasn't like, worried about like any quote unquote failures I had in the past, wasn't worried about the future. I was present, busting my ass and was willing to do whatever the fuck it took to succeed. And because of that, I succeeded, you know, and it's kind of funny because I always will tell people like, you know, I can't, I've spoken to at least in the last 12 plus years, you know, people that were getting involved in wholesaling or real estate in some capacity. And like, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to kill it, blah, blah, blah. And I give them the same advice, you know, like, listen, this is simple, but it's not easy. You're going to want to give up in a month or two. You know, if you don't give up, you keep putting in the work, you mark it like it'll work. Less than 1% of the people that I've ever spoken to actually like stick to it, you know, because like they get unrealistic expectations and they're not like fully committed, right? They think like, oh, this is going to be easy and I'm going to get this in the next 30 to 60 days. Well, it ain't fucking easy. And it's rare to have like very quick success. And it's like when that stuff doesn't happen, you know, people fold. But to me, that's kind of why like the majority of people don't get ahead in life. And very few people actually do. Gosh, there's so much. You know, you, you talk like very straightforward, transparent and honest. I love that. I know you follow Andy Frisella, 75 hard. So Ed was my lat interviewed him like a couple of weeks ago something. And he talked about entrepreneurs. So of the population, there's like 7% that are entrepreneurs. And only 1% of those people actually make it. Yeah. Well, I was, I, when you said 7% are entrepreneurs, I was going to say an entrepreneur is something that you can actually identify as and not be right. Yeah. Like people say they are entrepreneurs, but just by title. And that's about it. You know, because it actually takes like work, hustle, grind. It is not for the faint of heart. Like I tell people like nobody's ever fucking in the last since January of 2010. Nobody's pushed me to get up and work or, you know, held me accountable to work or anything like that. And from my experience, just through hiring people and stuff, the majority of people need that. They need to be micromanaged. They need to be pushed. They need to be kind of held accountable and stuff like that. And it's a rare breed for you to kind of be a successful entrepreneur, in my opinion. It's, it's a rare breed. And I do think it takes a special type of person. One, you have to have confidence and belief in yourself. If you believe in yourself, you can do anything in this world that you want to. You can't do everything, but you can do anything. Yeah. I think the number one thing to have is confidence. And that's something I recognize that you have confidence in yourself, in belief that you can do whatever you set your mind to. I think that's the number one thing. I really do. Yeah. Then behind that is commitment. Whatever that means to you, commitment, discipline, consistency. Whatever the commitment is, disciplined and consistency. And then after that, you just do the work. You show up at the gym. You go for the run, the walk. You do the calls. You do the conversations. You eat the right food, whatever the thing is. Yeah. Yeah. I always say like desire works. times belief 
times action equals whatever the fuck you want in life. If you have a strong desire to get anything, right? Like a strong desire, you truly believe, like not bullshit yourself and like, oh, I, you know, I believe, like, no, you got to really desire it, really believe that you can get it. And then you put that, put the work behind that stuff. You could literally get whatever you want in life. And if you ain't who or where you want to be, I guarantee it's because you don't really desire it. You don't really believe that you can get it or deserve it, or you're not putting in the work or a combination of those three. Yeah, you do. That's a good point. The whole three of them are really important. So Frank, some advice for people. Like, how do people get clear? How did you get clear? Uh, just doing the work, you know, like, shit like it's funny because like i say now it took me over 10 years of doing something i didn't you know that i'm not doing and was good at to kind of figure out like to get me into what i was doing you know like that the thing that i'm supposed to be doing i should say right so too often people want to kind of be like they want to be like oh like this is like my passion my purpose and it's like they're doing nothing to find the passion and purpose and I promise you, if you just kind of like focus and kind of take a step and start putting in the work towards something, maybe like what that path that you're going down, like ain't going to be like what the end goal or end passion and purpose is. But if you do the work, you're going to find that passion and purpose along the way. Too often, I think that people just ain't willing to kind of put in the work and put their head down and kind of Again, just put in the work and, and figure that out along the way. You know, I, shit, to be honest, like I thought I would do residential real estate in Philadelphia for the rest of my life. And then, you know, until I, it got to a point where it was like, I knew that I did not want to be doing it. And that was scary, you know, like, because I was good at it, made good money. But it's like, like, if I, all that, what I went through prepared me for the transition. Like if I did not do all of this stuff for the last 10 plus years in the Philadelphia market, like it would have been so much more of a difficult transition and shit, I maybe have never made the transition. So you talked a little bit about what that transition looked like. You closed down the wholesaling business, the flipping business and all that. But how did, what steps did you take to, and mentors did you find? I know you brought up a couple of them. Um, Wes, what you say? Wes, um, Wes Watson, yeah, but Wes. what steps would somebody have to take if they wanted to take a path like Frank, like door to commercial real estate, industrial properties on a national level? Just educating yourself. I definitely always say like men having a mentor and educating yourself like through people that have had more experience than you will shortcut like, you know, what you're doing. But especially like people, you'd be surprised like how transferable the skills of what I was doing with houses was to doing the like larger assets from a sales and marketing standpoint there's really not much difference between what i did with houses and what i do with like larger assets the biggest difference is you know with houses i'm looking at comps within like a tenth of a mile in philly a quarter of a mile like a half a mile in the burbs or whatever well with larger commercial assets it's not based off of comps it's based off of cap rates financial information so just how to analyze the deals is is completely different and you know it took some learning what did you do to learn that just research like I, i'm always just even like wholesaling how i learned her wholesaling was literally just research and trial and error like that's like going on youtube or taking a class yeah. well no cap rates was something that i was like familiar with like how to calculate but yeah like the term like um and I would say I'm one of my unique abilities is being resourceful. Like if I need to know something, I'm just going to find somebody that knows the information and pick their brain, especially at this point. Cause I'm like, I've been in the game a while. I have some like good connections and stuff. I didn't need help with the sales and marketing to get the deals, but like the cap rate stuff. And in particular, because like even determining cap rates, like the, the market cap rates for different asset classes, you know, it's are different. different. Yeah. So it's like different I per market. Exactly. But I knew people in mobile home space, in apartments. So I was able to kind of use them as resources. One, Tim Bratz, who was like kind of my motivation, I guess you could say, behind the transition, because I seen he was killing it with apartment buildings. I did took some like education of his before. He definitely like inspired me to make the transition because I was like, sh I was like, shit, if he, if we were in a mastermind together and we, you know, he at one point in time was doing a little bit of everything. Then he completely burned the ships, shut everything down in like, I think 2017 and went from a point where he owned a couple hundred doors to like 4,500 doors in like a four year period, just by getting super laser focused on like one niche. Sounds so easy, but yet so difficult. Yeah. I always say it's simple, 
but not easy. It's simple concepts. It's not like rocket science. I always tell people, because if it was rocket science, I sure shit wouldn't be doing it. But it's not, it's not easy, but it is simple. Like shit, like I got a Philadelphia public school education. So definitely not rocket science. So you just brought up the masterminds. Are you in any masterminds right now? Oh yeah, definitely. So Wes watching, that's more like fitness, personal development, Mark Evans, that's like real estate and business. And then a few other ones that are kind of more like local and like online as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to, you know, like level up and, and like learn from people that are in a, a further along in their journey than I am. And to me, because um, all you're doing is you're paying to get a shortcut. Like it took me to kind of give you an example. I was like, so like, just like poor mindset and ghetto. And just when I started and shit, like in my mind that like, I didn't want to ask for help. I just had a fuck you type of mentality. And because of that, like it took me 18 months to get to a point where I was consistently closing deals. If I started today with my mindset, like that would never, it would never take me so long because I would ask for help. I would like create relationships where I would just, my mindset just was not there. And it cost me, you know, like I could have spent a little bit of money in the short term, educated myself. And then probably instead of taking 18 months, you know, to get to a point where I was consistently closing deals, maybe that takes six to eight months. So how much revenue did I miss out on for a year because I was, you know, too stubborn or whatever to, you know, get and ask for help. Yeah. That's a big thing for people to overcome. Um, but if you can overcome it, your runway is so much shorter. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Because it's like you, you, like I even do like some mentoring and stuff now, like with the, the, you know, commercial and industrial. And I tell people like, listen, like shit, you can go figure it out on your own. Like, I don't give a fuck, but shit, if somebody gate what I like, sell and how I work with people. If somebody gave me this shit when I started, like it would have you know, shortened my learning curve significantly. And like, if it doesn't make sense and you're not willing to, it's doesn't make sense. Don't do it. But like too often people look at it as, as like an expense. It's an investment, right? Like you're going, if you actually invest in something and you like utilize it, you will get a return on that investment. But if you look at it as like an expense where it's just like, Oh, I just like spent this money and I'm not going to get it back. That's a, like a shitty ass mindset and you're not going to get it back. Invest in oneself. It's just like you, know, you invest to go to a conference, you invest to go to college. I don't know how that's a big investment. Yeah. Like to in, me, in like, this day and age, I don't know that you need to spend all that money. <laughs> no, like it. And to me, like you should constantly be trying to like, you know, get back. Up. Yeah. Like seriously, like if you're not trying to, if you are, if you're just, even if you're staying the same, you're getting worse as the other people around you are getting better, you know? And to me, like one thing I definitely like realized that, and I think this is just us as human beings, if we aren't striving to get better, like we don't really feel good about ourselves. Like I know that to be true about myself. And I just and I feel pretty confident in saying that most human beings are that way. And, you know, whether they know it or not, or want to acknowledge it or not. Like if you're just stagnant, you know, you ain't doing shit with your life. You ain't got no goals and ambitions and trying to like, you know, grow and get better. And I'm not even just saying from like a financial perspective, like just all around. But like you, you can't be happy with yourself, in my opinion. Yeah, that's tough. A lot of people get stuck into this little rut, but the only one that can change it is you. Yeah. Yeah. And that by like I'm really like I, I got like a podcast now called Fuck It, you know, P.H.U.C. K I T like it's a play on words because I'm from Philly, obviously, but how I had mentioned earlier, I would get the fuck it's like, I knew I wasn't supposed to be drinking. I'd be going to a bar my conscience, like turn the fuck around and go home. Fuck it. I'm gonna go anyway. Well, this is a different type of fuck it, a blessing, not a curse. I want to show people if they can change their mind, they can change their life. But like, to me, mindset is literally everything and they should be teaching it in like kindergarten, moving all the way through school. You know, it's like if you like I go back to the equation, desire, belief and action. But it's like my parents didn't teach me this shit. You know, school didn't teach me this shit. I didn't even like learn about it until like I was, you know, I guess in my mid to late 20s. And it was by happenstance. Like, I'll never forget. And it's crazy because I had that mindset of like, I'm not going to fail. Like when I got in real estate, but I was still had a very like scarce, poor mindset. And I can remember like it was yesterday. It was probably like 2012 or 2013. There was a, a guy that had a turnkey real estate company in Philly, Jay Walsh. 
and I used to do a lot of business with him and a deal was falling apart. He was kind of getting pissy about it or whatever. And I'm like, Jay, I said, don't worry about it. I said, I'm going to get this shit done. I said, don't even fucking worry about it. And he's like, oh, you must know about the secret. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you just said that and you don't know about the secret. I'm like, what fucking secret are you talking about, Jay? Like, you know, and he's like, listen, hang up. We're going to hang up the phone. Go Google the first 15 minutes of the secret and then call me back. Oh, well, I did that. And the secret is pretty much the law of attraction. And it was just like, boom. It was like, I'm, and, and it was like, God damn, like you literally, your negative ass has been like just creating all this negative shit and attracting it into your life for so long. And to give an example of that. So again, this is 2012, 2013. Like I started in 2010. Up until that point, when I was getting a quote unquote big deal, like where I was going to make 10 or 20 grand on a deal, because I was pretty much making five, I would get scared. Like I would get fearful. I would say, oh shit, like the buyer's going to screw me out of the deal. The seller isn't going to show up. And guess what happened more in those three years than in the next 10? That the buyer screwed me out of the deal. The seller didn't show up because like we're energy and like we detract, you know. Our, your, your thoughts become things and you literally the energy you put out good or bad you are going to attract and it sounds fucking crazy because trust me it's before no that, it doesn't because the universe gives you what you ask for yep. so if you walk around like, you you see, yep it doesn't know the difference nope you know it doesn't know the difference so we gotta i do my best to put out positive energy yeah right? because that's what i want back so if you have people surrounded by you, like you're in a sales meeting and you've been there, Frank, right? And they're sitting there like pouting or looking down or whatever. I'm like, wake up, people. Because you're you sitting like this, your closed-minded bullshit yeah. is wrecking my energy. Even you're in my aura. Go away. Literally just crossing their arms of that is literally a sign of that. Like it's like they're putting their guard up, like it's a negative like type of energy sign. I'm sick of this shit. Yeah, and it's to me, it's like I, I just like have you got rid of everybody because you're probably sick of it. Yeah, yeah I was literally just going to say, like, if you ain't helping me get money, get better, or something positive, or at least you ain't trying to kind of get on that path, I have no time for you. Like, we're energy, like, and I'm not trying to have you suck the positive energy out of me. Now, like, again, like, I'm not saying, like, if somebody's like kind of at, like, you know, trying to level up, like, I, you know, I would love to help you level up. But again, if you ain't trying to, you know, grow in some capacity, like mind, body, soul, or, or business. We just don't got that much in common. Life's too short, Frank. Yep. Life's too short. One thing I learned when I was about seventh grade or so, my dad came home one day and he said, gave me like this little card, you know, index cards and said, PMA, positive mental attitude. And every day in my school book, you know, we have a, it was composition books at the top of the little paper page. I'd write PMA and I'd underline it and I'd stare at it. And then the next day I'd write PMA. And, you know, I had a lot of difficulties uh, growing up in different ways. And, and all the things though, when I look back, and maybe you feel this way too, like that's stuff that made you who you are today. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Like that's why I, like, I don't give up. Yeah. Like, I don't give up. Everything. Like I've been through like a lot, like since I was like a young kid, but it's like in hindsight, it just prepared me to be as strong as I am and to be able to, you know, appreciate the good from all the bad. hundred percent perspective. Yep. Yeah. And Respect. at the end of the day, like shit, like even though like it's, you know, again, like my life has been, you know, I would say like difficult compared to most. There's a ton of fucking people that have had it way fucking worse than I have. And and me, I always like think it could be worse. Like even going through like the divorce and shit, like it was not like it was definitely a painful like situation. Like we were together a really long time. Like I loved her, still love her. But it was like, you know, everything happens for a reason. And it's like nobody died. Like that's literally what I thought in my mind. Like, you know, shit, like I'm alive, she's alive, like nobody died. It could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah, I always look at it. People, you know, complain about real estate and interest rates. And I'm like, I said, okay, open up the MLS. How many houses went under contract today? Why didn't you put that under contract? Because we create our own economy. We, we, we create our own economy. It doesn't yeah. matter what's going on. People will always need to buy and sell real estate, whether it's a house, an investment, 
land, whatever. doesn't matter. Somebody's always going to be part of that transaction. Hopefully. Yeah, there, there's to me, it's again, it's just a mindset thing. Like people will kind of see like the market has been changing or whatever. Like, you know, it's been more uncertain, you know, the last like couple of years were 12 months or so than it was for like a while. And people will say like, Oh, like, what do you think about the market? Are you scared about like, you know, there's not going to be opportunity. Like, no, like, I don't even fucking think about that. Like, it doesn't even cross my mind. <laughs> like, real estate transacts every day. So I'm going to be a part of it. Like, you can decide not to be a part of it, but that's a choice that you make. But I'm not making that decision. If anything, when the market's bad, there's going to be more opportunities. And to me, when the market's good, there are opportunities. Like, I'm an opportunist. I'm, like, searching for opportunities. Uh, now, you can kind of close your mindset and think that there's not and I'm pretty confident we will both be right that's right because whether you think you think you can either way you're right. you're right yep that's one of my favorite quotes Henry T. Ford yeah yep I would quote I quote it a lot and we start like our daily huddles with quotes and or end with a quote depending on day but it's a truism that's for sure it really is yeah so Frank before we wrap it up if you're a book reader or a podcast listener anything that any I'm a huge reader. Uh, like I, I'm an avid reader. A couple of years ago, I actually set a goal to do 52 books in a, in a year. And I read like 56 books. Go Giver is an amazing book. Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Everyone knows Think, of, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Outwitting the Devil, in my opinion, a significantly better book. What's that about? It honestly is just about like mindset. Like it's where in essence, he kind of interviews the devil, you know, and it's just literally all about like, you know, just negative and positive and just kind of how like universal laws are, but it's an amazing book. I'm uh, reading it now for like the fourth or fifth time. Can't Hurt Me by Goggins is an amazing book. Do Dog by uh, the founder of Nike, but those four are like, you know, really good. Awesome. It was, oh gosh, it's just so insightful today, Frank. Thank you so much for sharing time with us. I'm excited for you and your future and all the great things that you have and your new podcast. That's awesome. How can people find you if they want to reach out, learn more about what you do? Just on Facebook, Frank McGovern, you can reach out or on Instagram, fuck it, Frank, which is a P H U C K I T F R A N K. Yeah. You can hit me up on each or either social media platform. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on Be The Solution Podcast. I greatly appreciate you having me on, Maria, and uh, hopefully your, your audience got some good value from it. Yeah. My pleasure.